Tonight on Reporting Scotland. Campaigners win a challenge at the Supreme Court against the Scottish Government's named person legislation. The Syrian refugees who are settling into their new community in Butte. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, my child, yes, learn English quickly. <laughs> also on the programme. Lighting up the city, Edinburgh's art festival takes to the streets. It's a big night of European football here at Pataudry Stadium. Can Aberdeen take a step closer to qualifying for the Europa League? And on the 150th birthday of Beatrix Potter, we visit the Dunkeld home where she wrote the tale of Peter Rabbit. Good evening. It's designed to safeguard the rights and well-being of children under 18. But the government's named person legislation has been heavily criticised as allowing private information about children to be shared among professionals without the consent of parents or young people. Today, the UK Supreme Court agreed, meaning the legislation can't be introduced by the end of August as planned. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Arrival Alderson, reports. The government's controversial scheme was designed to safeguard the rights and well-being of children under 18. A named person won't be assigned to a child, but would be available to assist them and their parents in ensuring the young person's welfare. But a group of charities challenged the legislation in the courts, arguing it contravened their human rights to privacy and family life. Lord Hodge will explain the decision of the court. Five judges at the UK Supreme Court, including two from Scotland, were asked to agree, and on one point they did. This court, in a judgment written by Lady Hill, Lord Reed and me, unanimously allows the appeal on the second of the three grounds, and that is because of the breach of Article 8 of ECHR. Outside the court, the charities who brought the case hailed a victory. It was unwanted, it was unworkable, and it was undemocratic. And today, the judges have put a stop to that. They have said that the key data sharing provisions at the heart of the named person scheme are defective and they cannot go ahead. The McIntosh family from Falkirk were all in court and were pleased the judges agreed with their argument. Families should have the right to privacy and the right to a family life to bring their children up as they see best, not how the state decides that they should be brought up perhaps disagreeing with philosophical or religious views of parents. The murder of five-year-old Danielle Reed in Inverness 13 years ago prompted changes in child protection, which led to the named person scheme. Killed by her mother's boyfriend, her disappearance wasn't picked up by the authorities. There was no named person point of contact. Highland Council, which established the scheme, regards it as a vital child protection measure. We have the name person because children and families said that they wanted a single point of contact. We've seen it works. We've seen it improve services. We've seen that it reduces risk. I'm really pleased that we've got a positive endorsement of that today. I hope we can now all move forward together to implement for the benefit of children, young people and families. Ministers must now adjust the scheme to ensure it complies with human rights laws. They're adamant, though, it's staying on the statute book. This court case was an attempt to bring about the scrapping of the named person policy and it has failed. The court has required us to improve and to clarify the data sharing proposals within the legislation. That is exactly what the Scottish Government will do and we will proceed as swiftly as we possibly can do to implement the named person policy taking into account the points raised with us by the Supreme Court. The government insists its named person scheme isn't in pieces. It was due to come into force at the end of next month. Now ministers will present proposed changes when MSPs return to Holyrood in September. Reven Alderson reporting Scotland. I'm joined from Holyrood by our political correspondent Glenn Campbell. We heard from John Swinney there. What does the government do now? 
Well, the judges say named person is fine in principle, flawed in practice, so the Scottish Government has to deal with the flaws. In theory, they've got 42 days to come up with plans to address the court's concerns, but in reality, the Government thinks it has more flexibility, more breathing space than that, because of the decision they took today not to go ahead with the legislation as planned on the 31st of August. So they haven't ruled out the Liberal Democrats' idea of recalling Parliament during the summer to deal with this, but I think Reval's right. They would prefer to wait until Parliament comes back in September. One of the changes I think they will look at is taking the guidelines which sit alongside this legislation and making them part of the legislation to offer an extra safeguard for human rights. That in itself won't be enough to satisfy Labour. They want a more fundamental review of the guidelines. It certainly won't satisfy the Conservatives, who think named person is over the top and should be scrapped. But remember, this idea has broad support from children's charities and from all the parties in the Scottish Parliament except the Conservatives. So it's being delayed, but it's not being dropped. And I think ministers still hope that it can take effect before the end of this year. Glenn Campbell, thank you very much. Syrian refugees resettled on the Isle of Bute have given their first television interviews to say thank you for the warm welcome they've received. Earlier this week, two other Syrian families were reported as being unhappy on the island. Eileen Clark has been to meet refugees who say they're keen to become part of the community on Butte. Rothsey on the Isle of Butte is trying hard to recapture its heyday as a pretty stop-off for tourists and holidaymakers. But since December, it's also become a place of refuge for 15 Syrian families fleeing the war at home. In one of the local hairdressers, this Syrian barber is brushing up on his skills on a work placement, which he hopes will be his first step to getting him back in the workplace. I have uh, 16 years working in Syria and I have a uh, salon. He's working in this salon on a voluntary basis to add to his hairdressing skills and his English. And his two children are setting a good example. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, my child, yes, learn English quickly. <laughs> <laughs> are they quicker than you? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, in school, yes, I speak with, uh, with, with uh, friends, yes, uh, learn. He does one day a week, and his fellow hairdressers are noticing that already his chat is getting better. But his English is improving week by week as he comes in, he's learning more words and he's been able to understand people and he's experiencing jokes and things, which is very good for him. He, along with others in the little Syrian community here, have been willing volunteers at the island's music festival, which gets underway tomorrow. Now, today they may have been organising the bins, but a couple of weeks ago they met royalty. I met my Emir Charles. He's fine here. He's very good here. The island is uh, very good here. And there have been other excitements too. A new baby daughter for this man and his wife just a few weeks ago. A baby sister for his son. Uh, the the neighbours were so lovely and I, I thank them for everything. Some are worried that there's no halal meat readily available on the island but the support they've received seems to be helping in the adjustment to island life. I love working. Most people, they've, they've been so open-hearted with us. So we, we have to uh, return this, uh, this great treatment. There's no mosque on the Isle of Butte, but the parish priest has loaned the refugees his church hall for their worship. And it's that kind of kindness which is encouraging these families to rebuild their lives here. But they're aware it will be a long, hard road to get back to the kind of jobs and businesses they once had. Aileen Clark, reporting Scotland. Economic forecasters are reporting that the vote for Brexit could spark a sharp slowdown in Scotland's economy. The Fraser Vallander Institute also predicts that the jobless rate will rise. With that and other business news, here's our business and economy editor, Douglas Fraser. Well, the prospects for the Scottish economy were already getting worse earlier this year, but following the vote for Britain to leave the European Union, 
they've worsened a lot. Growth next year was forecast to rise nearly 2%. Now, these Strathclyde University economists are saying only half of 1% and possibly recession. They're saying uncertainty feeds a loss of confidence about spending and investing, feeding through to higher unemployment. That's forecast to rise this year by more than 20,000 from the most recent level and nearly as much again next year. Slower growth would also mean less tax revenue for Holyrood and for Westminster. So how far can government go to counteract the threat of a Brexit slump? The economics of Brexit were being discussed today at Holyrood. You know, the economy will return to growth. The question is whether it's going to be in the same level of growth as it was in the past post-EU. Uh, post um, so I, I think the longer term, you're moving less away from having a continued stimulus to actually more is what policies are in place to help promote growth across the economy in a world where you're no longer part of the European Union. Well, the Brexit impact on low interest rates and bank earnings is one of the main reasons given by Lloyds Banking Group, parent to Bank of Scotland, as it announced another 3,000 jobs are to go and 200 more branches are to close. They're not saying where in the UK that will be. And in a busy day of other business news, the biggest distiller of Scotch whisky, Diageo, reported a 4% drop in the amount of Johnny Walker being sold. But as blended whiskies decline, there was an 8% rise in sales of its classic single malts. Distillers really need trade routes to stay open after Brexit. What's most important for us is let's keep Scotch whisky healthy. This is a thriving, successful business for the UK. And uh, my focus is really ensuring we get uh, uh, the right conditions uh, to continue to be successful because the runway for Scotch whisky around the world is very attractive, particularly in the emerging markets. Well, among other big employers in Scotland's oil and gas sector, a big fall in half-year profits for Shell. Centrica is cutting back on its North Sea production with no exploration going on at all. And there's Weir Group, a big engineer based in Glasgow. It sells services and equipment for oil drillers and frackers around the world, for miners, for power stations. And profits so far this year down by quarter. It shed half of its American workforce. And the chief executive, Keith Cochran, announced he's also leaving after seven years at the top. Douglas Fraser. The funeral of a Scottish soldier who died during a training exercise in Wales has taken place. Mourners lined the main street in Echofechen as the cortege left the village ahead of a funeral service in Dumfries. An investigation is continuing into the circumstances surrounding the death of 26-year-old Corporal Josh Hool, who was serving with the Rifles Regiment. He was set to marry his fiancée, Rachel McKee, next year and was due to be best man at his brother Tyrone's wedding in Edinburgh this Saturday. ScotRail passengers face more strikes in a long-running dispute over the increased use of trains without guards. It'll begin with a 48-hour walkout by members of the RMT union from Sunday the 7th of August. The RMT is against the use, the increased use of trains on which the driver opens and closes the doors at stations. ScotRail has said it's already common practice on the network. Edinburgh Art Festival gets underway today. One of the newest of the city's festivals, a mere 7 to 13 years old, it offers 46 exhibitions across the city in some surprising locations. Our arts correspondent, Polly McLean, reports. This miniature temple was designed to show art. The original marble statue removed because of fears of corrosion. But now, after 180 years, it's open again to the public and displaying a new work. Most of my work has, has been quite self-contained and has, has been um, shown in, in sort of white cube type gallery spaces. So the audience will be broader than if it was in a, in a specific kind of contemporary art space. Despite being a relative newcomer to the city's festival scene, the Edinburgh Art Festival has left its mark and many of the previous commissions have become permanent features, new monuments amid familiar landmarks. 
almost because the city is so familiar it becomes a bit invisible and I think that through projects like our festival commissions program and indeed the festival as a whole the way in which the whole city becomes so animated it's a real opportunity for all of us to look at places that are familiar um, and to discover new things. It's dark enough for the neons to keep their glow and to give that light. Use the ladder? Yeah. Artist Graham Fagan hopes his neon work will shed new light on an overlooked landmark, the stone staircase known as Jacob's Ladder. And unlike a conventional gallery, it's on public view day and night. And in a sense that makes the work not just mine, in a sense that makes the work belong to the city. You know, it's as much a part of the city, I hope, as Jacob's Ladder, the sign, the steps and everything else that's public in this city. With 46 exhibits across the city, from light ships to dazzle ships, there's certainly plenty to see, from today until the end of August. Pauline McLean reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. Well, let's take a look now at stories from across the country. Train services in and out of Glasgow Central are continuing to be disrupted after delays and cancellations. Thousands of commuters have been affected by problems with overhead power cables. ScotRail says that although the situation is improving, disruption is expected to continue for the rest of the day. BBC Scotland has learned that jobs are to go at Aberdeen University's medical school. Staff have been informed of the cost-cutting move. The university says it wants to invest in areas of the medical school that will deliver excellence in research and training. Police Scotland have still to confirm details of a fatal crash in Caithness this morning. A man died as a result of the incident on the A99 south of Keys. The road has remained closed with a local diversion in place. Edinburgh Council has hired 60 extra staff in an effort to keep the city clean over the festival period. They'll join existing workers to pick up litter and empty 500 bins across the city centre. For the first time, some bins will be fitted with monitors, which will show how quickly they get full. One of Scotland's most remote youth hostels, Loch Ossian on Rannoch Moor, is able to provide hot showers for the first time in its 85-year history. Thanks to the development of locally sourced hydropower, the hostel can now provide hot water, electric heating and even a fridge. Now, the tale of Peter Rabbit is known throughout the world. What's less well known is the role that Scotland played in the story. Beatrix Potter was born in 1866 and spent long family holidays in Perthshire. Now, 150 years on, Elizabeth Quigley has been given exclusive access to the house in Dunkeld, where she wrote some of her stories. Let's go! Go on a run. This is how Peter Rabbit is seen today a much-loved programme on CBBS. And this is where his story was first written down, Eastwood House in Dunkeld. I like to think that this was, the, this was perhaps where she was when she was sitting writing this story. On one holiday in 1893, two of her stories came to life. We know that because the, the name of the house and the day and the date were put at the top of the letters, the letters were sent to the small son of Beatrice's governess. He was unwell, so she sat down to write him a, a little note and thought, well, I'll write you a little story. And this was the story of Peter Rabbit. And I believe that the following day, feeling a little bit guilty that she'd written a nice little story for Noel, she wrote another story for his brother, uh, which was the tale of Jeremy Fisher. Here at Burnham Arts, the focus is not just on the stories, but the science of the world around us, which fascinated Beatrix Potter. When she came here from, as a child, she was coming from London, and she came to this beautiful place and was so impressed with, it, with her environment, it took her on another journey, which was nature and the environment, and she became very interested in fungi, and animals and birds. 150 years on, the stories still captivate, her scientific drawings still impress. Happy birthday, Beatrix Potter. Elizabeth Quigley reporting Scotland, Burnham.
Now let's go straight to David Curry, who's in Aberdeen for the big match. David. Yes, Sally, welcome to a Pataudry Stadium positively crackling with anticipation ahead of tonight's big game. It's Aberdeen versus Maribor of Slovenia in the first leg of their Europa League qualifying tie. Now, the Dons are facing a team with an impressive record against Scottish opponents in recent years, but that doesn't seem to be troubling them too much. If the whooping and hollering is anything to go by, the Dons are looking forward to this time. Our boys are confident. We've learned over the last few seasons, I think, um, to deal with European football. And um, I quite like the, the technical part of it, the, the tactical part of it as well. Um, we want to win every game we play and we always go on the front foot to try and win games. But the Slovenians have an impressive record against Scottish clubs, knocking Celtic out of the Champions League qualifiers two years ago, stopping Rangers reaching the Europa League in 2011 and doing the same to Hibs the previous season. So it's up to the Dons to buck the trend. We're well up for this game and we know we can win this game, so um, I wouldn't, if I was them I wouldn't take it lightly. We've had great results in, in Europe um, in the past couple of seasons, so... Um, we're hoping to, to have another good good round here and um, see what happens after that. Now, here's a spoiler alert. It looks like the Aberdeen manager's so confident of a win that he's been working on a victory celebration. Now, I'm sure the gentleman joining me now has been honing his uh, celebrations as well. It's the former Aberdeen captain and manager, Willie Miller. Willie, thanks for joining us tonight. Willie, fans I've been speaking to outside the stadium this evening are, shall we say, cautiously optimistic. Is that a feeling you share? Well, I, I think if uh, Aberdeen play to their true potential, then they've got a chance of getting through. Obviously, it'll be a really difficult tie uh, for them. Maribor's got uh, an excellent European pedigree. I think Aberdeen can look back uh, perhaps in the tie against Groningen, uh, the, the Dutch team, and look at that. And, you know, that will give them confidence that uh, they can come up against this type of quality and overcome them. However, Willie, does that record that Maribor have, they've been the scourge of Scottish clubs in recent years, does that not trouble you ever so slightly? No, I, I think it's a warning to Aberdeen that uh, this is, uh, you, you know, a team that can play, it's a team that can take care of Scottish teams that have done it in the past but I think uh, Derek McInnes put together a very fine squad they've done well in Europe in recent seasons and uh, they're looking to improve on that and uh, if they can improve on it the squad's been strengthened during the summer as well so if they're at their best I still think they've got a chance So if you were in Derek McInnes's shoes this evening what would you be saying to the players in that dressing room? Well, you know what I think he's got to try and instill confidence in them he's got to be saying to them that they've done well in recent seasons in Europe They've learnt a lot. The squad's generally stayed together in the last three seasons in European competition. They've got to put that to good use. They've got to go out and play and play with confidence. And if they do that, then there's a chance that they can qualify out of this, uh, out of this time. Very quick prediction for tonight's result? Well, I think Derek McInnes will want to stay in the game. Um, I can see Aberdeen maybe taking a, a very slim lead over. He'll be hoping that uh, Maribor don't score. I think that'll be important. Thanks very much, Willie. Well, you can listen to Willie and the rest of our uh, BBC team in Sports Sound tonight on BBC Radio Scotland and also online. The show is on air right now. But that's uh, enough from me, I think, tonight, Sally. Back to you in the studio. <laughs> Thanks very much, David. Church organist John Richards from Cardiff has spent almost 20 years travelling to every cathedral in Britain and playing the pipe organ. Now he's playing the last one on the list, Inverness. Craig Anderson went to see and hear him. It all began with a letter from John Richards' wife to Worcester Cathedral asking if he might be allowed to play the organ there. That was back in 1997 and they said yes. And that was the start of John's cathedral organ quest. Now that was the first cathedral. At that cathedral, um, Lynn bought this book, which is Discovering Cathedrals. And when I looked at this book, there were 94 in there. I thought, wow, that's tremendous. And there were no idea in my mind that I would ever do 94. So, like a Monroe bagger, John has travelled the length and breadth of the country, visiting cathedrals and playing their impressive instruments. We were on holiday. 
holiday in somewhere. For example, if we went to Canterbury, he played in Canterbury. We went to Truro, he played in Truro. And then gradually, he played 50 cathedrals, then 60. And I thought, gosh, you know, the, the goal is in sight. So should we try and play them all? And so that then became a bit more organised to, to get it all done. And here we are. This is the final one. So for someone who describes himself as a simple church organist, how did it feel to be sitting down at the keyboards at the end of a two-decade journey? It's been quite exciting, really. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous um, event for me. Um, the fact that I've come to the end is not going to make any difference to me in that sense. Um, I'll still play every Sunday in church. Playing the last one is something special. But like a Monroe bagger, once caught, that collecting bug is hard to shake off. John is now eyeing up all the cathedrals in Ireland. Craig Anderson reporting Scotland in the mess. <laughs> now let's see what we can expect from the weather. Here's Judith. Thank you, Sally, and a very good evening to you. Well, we've had low pressure to the north and to the south of us bringing outbreaks of freeing across northern and southern Scotland, but sandwiched in between some lovely spells of sunshine and predominantly dry. Now, as we head through the evening, that rain across more southern parts slides away to the south, although we will continue to see some showers across northern parts tonight, but uh, for most of us, it'll be dry with some clear spells as well, and temperatures generally around 10 to 12 Celsius, although in some of our highland glens, the East Highlands, inland Aberdeenshire, we could see values falling to around six or seven Celsius, so somewhat cooler. So tomorrow morning dawns lovely, good sunny spells from first light, although we will tend to see a bit of cloud bubbling up as we head through the day. Now across northern Scotland, as you can see, we will see some showers feeding in on a northwesterly breeze, but quite a different feel to the day tomorrow. I think in between those showers, it'll be drier and we will see some sunshine coming through. Fewer showers for Shetland, actually, and with lighter winds here. The odd heavy shower for Orkney and towards the northwest, but again, it'll still be bright. In between times, any showers towards the west coast further inland rattling through fairly quickly and temperatures responding where we see the best of the sunshine in the east and the south, 19, even possibly 20 Celsius, actually feeling very pleasant with light winds through central and southern Scotland. So just the odd passing shower as we head into Friday evening away from this northwest corner and it will be a fine end to the day. Now, as we head towards the weekend, we are looking at an area of low pressure anchored to the north of us. Now, what that is going to do is generate some showery activity across northern Scotland, but actually to the south of here, we will continue to see quite a lot of dry weather with spells of sunshine. So first thing is Saturday, it's really a lovely start once again, the odd shower for the southern uplands. A few showers dotted around across more northern parts. Quite a brisk wind across the north driving those showers through, though, and temperatures a wee bit lower, around 16 or 17 Celsius, and very much the same setup on Sunday. Sunny spells across the south and east, with fairly frequent showers for the northwest. That's your forecast. Thanks very much, Judith. That's reporting Scotland. I'll be back with the headlines at eight and the late bulletin just after the 10 o'clock news. Until then, have a good evening.